Hey and welcome back to another episode of Mix with Marty. Today it's all about mastering to get your song release ready. And I'm gonna take the song from episode one. It's the song Good Question by Aaron Bowman. I'm gonna show you what I did plug-in-wise to the song to enhance it a little further. And we're also gonna have a look at um, the distribution services, for example, to get your song online released. So stay tuned for that. All right, so before we jump into the session, we have to talk a little bit about mastering itself and what it's all about. Um, back in the day, um, especially when you think about the tape days and also when um, vinyl was a big thing, uh, mastering was all about to get the song, the mix, into the various formats like cassette or tape, 8-track or vinyl, for example, because you had to do a little bit different mastering for each um, um, media format, actually. Um, so nowadays, where probably most of the songs are released digital, I mean, there are some um, vinyl releases and vinyl came back big time, um, but we're not going to talk about that because I actually don't do a mastering for vinyl, um, but I do uh, mastering for various streaming services and digital releases. And so we, um, we, we take a closer look here how to prepare your song, for example, for iTunes, Spotify and so forth. I'm going to also show you how to master um, your song for the Apple Digital Masters program. Um, there is a plugin that you need and also um, there are some specifics that you need to take care of before you release it um, for a Apple Master. And I'm also going to show you the um, plugin chain that I used for this song. It's not always the same, but it's a, a good starting point for you, for your songs maybe. Um, and when you think about getting a mix up to mastering, probably most people will say, well, we have to get it louder to a certain um, degree, actually, without clipping it. So mastering is not about just getting it louder, just to slam a brick wall limiter on there um, with a out ceiling and that's it. Um, mastering is about critical listening to the various songs. Um, and also what I recommend when you do your mastering yourself is to listen to a lot of different music genres. Um, you really have to build up um, or train actually your ear and your brain um, to critically listen to music. Um, and of course, you always have to listen to music just for joy and to relax and, and, and um, be comfortable with that. But um, you have to really listen for certain things in songs that might um, a lot of people not hear. And of course, you need good monitoring system, you need a treated room, but the most important thing is to listen to a lot, a really a lot of music. And um, also have reference songs, for example, where you can compare your uh, master to that. Um, and as I said, with the monitoring, you need good speakers, um, especially they should go down in the low end quite to 30, 20 hertz would be really good. So if you have smaller speakers, you might get a um, subwoofer so you can really hear what's going on in the low end. Um, but also a good tip is to listen um, to the song with headphones, with uh, good headphones. Most of them go down to 20 hertz, so 20 to 20,000 hertz. Um, and for example, I always check the song still on my hi-fi system, which is in my living room. Um, it's a big old vintage machine and I still listen to all the songs on that one because I know the speakers. And this is a very, very key factor actually to know your system. It doesn't matter actually what speakers you use, um, what brand for example, but you just have to know your room and your monitoring system. And always check the song on different um, speakers, headphones, Apple earbuds, um, stereo, hi-fi, mono, Bluetooth speaker, or the good old car check. 
um, because then you can actually hear how your song might translate for um, the people that are listening to the music. All right, so this is the first thing. And another thing that you should be careful is um, to know what has to be done to a song and where you should leave it alone. And this is probably the most difficult part in mastering. And that's also why um, that interconnects with um, that mix mixing engineers and also producers give the song to another mastering engineer. Um, I mean, we talk here about when you did your mix yourself and you, you want to get it um, online without having a third party listen to it, um, is always a little bit difficult, um, especially when you think of you just mastered your mix and you immediately go to the mastering stage. Um, what I recommend if you do your own mastering is to always have some days in between to get um, a kind of like a reset to your ears or to the song itself because you will listen to it differently. Um, there is also the option that you might use different speakers for the mastering. So to, to really hear how the mix sounds um, all the way through the master with a different set or also in another room, for example. Um, if you have another room that is treated quite a bit. Um, so there's an option and the reason why, as I said, many producers or mix engineers give the song to a dedicated mastering engineer is to have another set of ears listen to the song um, and they can decide if the song is ready for release or not. Um, but of course, um, it is totally possible to do the, the mastering yourself if you have um, a little bit of experience. And I mean, it's just trial and error. You have to do quite a lot of masters to, and also listen to a lot of music, as I said, um, to, to learn this craft, actually. I mean, it's not rocket science, but um, you, you just have to do that. You just have to mix and master um, different genres and a lot of songs, um, and you will get better from time. So um, I would say we now jump right in, and as we go along with the mastering, I'm, I'm going to tell you um, why I did certain things and why I did not certain things, especially in this song. And um, yeah, so I would say let's jump right in now in the session, and I'm going to show you what I did. All right, so here we have the mastering session. As you can see, I have a mix here, which is the standard stereo mix, and I duplicate the mix with my master track with various plugins that I come to in a minute. Um, I have the mix always here, um, and I also have reference mixes in there sometimes just to listen how it compares to other mixes. But just for this session, I'm going to go with those two, the master and the mix. Um, so just I can see how it um, sounds unmixed and mixed. As you can see, I have the L2 here as well as on the master track here. Um, so just that we have um, pretty much the same level and we can um, check how it sounds um, with the same volume. So um, I play you the mix now with the limiter on. So we have the same level with the master, and then I'm going to play you the master. What I used to know, I don't know The ground underneath opened to its core And I think that you, you're telling lies You wouldn't know the truth if it hits you from behind Okay, let's go to a little bit of the louder section here well, maybe you didn't mean it, but maybe you did. The way that I see it, so you thought either way. So 
what do I believe? All right. And now the mastered version with all the plugins on. What I used to know, I don't know anymore. The ground underneath opened to its core, and I think that you, your telling lies, and again, you wouldn't section. know. Maybe you didn't mean it But maybe you did The way that I see it So you thought of either way So what do I believe? It's a damn good question Okay, so um, let's start off with the plugins off, um, but not DL2. So we have um, a quite a bit of output here. And um, let's start off with the first one that I actually didn't use um, on the master here. Um, but this is basically a plugin, it's the S1 Imager, where I can manipulate the um, stereo image of the track. Um, sometimes you have mixes that um, tend to be a little bit more right or left sided. Um, so you can um, change not only the width of the stereo field with the slider, but you can change um, also the rotation. So if the song is a little bit um, a little bit more pronounced on the right side, you might um, emphasize a little bit more the left stereo image, and you can also change the um, asymmetry a little bit, um, depending what you want. Um, so just for the sake of it, um, I'm going to show you what this plugin is actually doing. So let's see. Go back to zero. So for example, you can make it mono. They can really spread it out, which is way too much because you get quite a lot of face issues here, as you can see. I'm going to explain why I use those meterings in a minute. Um, first of all, when you think of stereo image, um, you want the song to have um, a little bit more space, especially on the left and the right side, to open it up a little bit more. Um, it's always the best to do that in the mixing itself, um, because you pan certain instruments, for example guitars or electric guitars, um, to the left and right, hard left or hard right, or um, a little bit um, closer. Um, so doing that with the S1 imager is maybe the last step that you can open up a song. Um, but if the song sounds narrow in the mix itself, I wouldn't do it solely with this one. It's just a little bit more of an enhancement, if you if you can say that. Um, but I mostly use that for um, rotation if it's um, a little bit unbalanced left and right side. And you can change it. Um, I mean, you don't do too much changes, I think maybe around three here to the right or to the left is quite okay. If you have to do more, it's better to go back into the mixing stage and do it there. Um, but also a little bit of a stereo width um, is quite okay. But I didn't use this here because I mixed the song the way I wanted to sound it and to have the space that it has now. So I didn't use the S1 imager. But I can show you now with the first metering plugin. I have inserted actually three of those. So I have the um, Waves PA Set Analyzer, where I have a 
frequency response um, chart here and also um, the stereo image left and right, as well as meterings. But for the main metering, um, in terms of loudness, I use the WLM plus from Waves, um, where I can clearly see the short term LUFS, so the loudness unit full scale and also the long term. Um, and most importantly, the true peak. And I come into the true peak in a minute. And then I have also this the standard multimeter of logic um, where I can see um, the I use it mainly for also the stereo image and also for the meterings just as a second um, check. All right, so let me show you, let's make it mono, what the face is actually doing and the stereo image. So this is now mono, as you can see. And what you basically want is to get a nice um, balance of the left and right. So let's bring it up again. What I used As you can see, it gets a little bit wider now. It's clear I memory. Don't, don't be too distracted with the anti-face peaks here. We have also in this section here the correlation meter and the face is actually quite okay. And if you stay here in the green side, um, it's totally fine. But you should not come to you know um, the left side the into the orange and red because you have face problems then in your mix and you might have to change that in the mix then. Maybe For example, when we spread it out way too much, we got quite a lot of um, face problems left and right and you can also see here in the correlation meter of logic and you can also especially when you hear it with headphones now you can hear there is something strange going on and as we bring it back into the middle more it sounds much more pleasing but again I didn't use the plugin so when we look here at the meter again, left and right, we have a nice stereo image. Here the face is really okay and that's what we want. So that's the S1 imager and I used that as I said um, just to change the rotation and the width a little bit but not in this song. And now let's go to the next plugin which is the EQ. I'm gonna tell you what I do with the loudness um, at the very last step um, and I'm gonna explain um, why I use a certain loudness. Um, but first of all let's talk a little bit about the EQ. Um, as I mixed the song I had already a mix bus processing going on so I mixed into a compressor and also an EQ that had a slight um, high end bump and a low end bump, so kind of like a smiley curve EQ. Um, I always do that. Um, it saves not only time in mixing because it gets you a little bit faster to the desired output. Um, um, you can also do that, for example, then in the mastering if you leave your mix bus flat and mix the instruments, vocals and drums um, on the individual tracks a little bit more. But I like doing it um, also on the master bus, just a very slight bump in the high end, the low end. And that's why you can see here on the linear phase EQ, I really like that plugin, it's the standard logic um, phase EQ. Um, you can see no bump in the high end and also in the low end. So what I do with the first stage of the EQ here is um, to make mainly cuts, um, even though I made a little bump here, um, um, especially in the low end. In this song, when you listen closely, um, there is quite a bit of low-end information in there. Um, but as it's such a driving factor to my ear, I don't want to, for example, make a low cut at 50 hertz, which sometimes is necessary on some songs, but not all. Um, so I made a low cut here at 35 hertz. Um, and I also reduced from 90 on negative 1 dB um, the low end a little bit because it was a little bit just a tad bit too much um, so let's listen without the EQ 
and then width. Maybe let's go to the section here. So the low end is just a little bit more controlled um, and that's basically all I did here with this EQ in the low end. And as you can see, I used a slight bump at 1000 Hz um, with 2 dB just to have a little bit more presence in the vocals to get um, also the guitars a little bit more out. Let's take it away. Okay. When you listen to it, um, there is plenty of Hyatt in there. That's why I didn't want to boost any um, anything above 10,000 hertz even more. I was totally fine with that. And when we look at the next plugin, um, which is a metering plugin, it's the Tonal Balance that you probably have seen in my other videos, um, which shows you, it's from Isotope, and that shows you basically a frequency response curve um, that is just right for quite a lot of different genres. And when your song is in this area here, you might have a good chance that your song will sound good, even though as we listen to it, we always have to check with the ears. But this is just a graphic um, help kind of to, to get or, or, or to actually see how your song compares to other songs. So let's see. As you can see in the high end, we are right in the spot there, also in the low end. Maybe a little bit more pumped in the two to one, uh, one to 2000 hertz area might be good, but we might also get that later on with um, a little bit of compression in that band. And as you can see, it's not totally correct because when the vocals are obviously away, um, it will increase a little bit the low end. But it's a really nice plugin just to get a basic idea how uh, your song might perform with other songs. Um, so next plugin is um, the first compressor. And I use most of the time the TDR Kotelnikov. It's a free compressor. There is also a paid version which has a little bit more features, but I use just the, the free version. Um, it's totally fine and a really solid compressor for mastering. Um, what I did here, there is a low frequency relax here. Um, I went here with 90 Hertz, so the compressor doesn't react um, to the lower frequencies, which is always nice because you get the rich bottom end. Um, sometimes compressors, or actually quite a lot of compressors, or nearly all of them, um, react to the whole frequency spectrum and the low end is always a little bit of a tricky problem for compressors because they react a little bit too much to them. So you get more compression um, because just of the low end, um, but not with this one. And it's also nice when we look here at the attack and release, you have two release stages. So one is the peak and one is the RMS. Um, and this is especially nice because when you think of a compressor, um, especially in the mix bus or on the master bus, you want it to be a little quicker, so not too slow. Um, and you can set here the release peak faster and the release RMS a little bit slower as I did here, 400 MS and 60. Um, and this doesn't kind of like suck all the energy out um, of the mix but it just does the right amount of release. Um, attack is here 9ms, so 10ms is always a good starting point in mastering. Um, the ratio is 2 to 1. I wouldn't go anything above 2 to 1 or 2.5 to 1 in mastering, also not on the, on the mix bus when you're mixing, for example. 
um, soft knee setting and um, mainly compression is 1 dB, 1.5, so let's see. But maybe you did the way that I see it. So, far, so as you can see, it's not way. doing too much. So what do I believe? Let's see here. So approximately on the peaks, one dB just of gain reduction with this compressor. And um, as you probably can tell now is that I do very little increments. Um, mastering is all about enhancing a song um, with, I would say, minimum input um, in terms of equalization and also compression. If there is anything you have to do EQ wise or compression wise that needs a little bit more, it's always better to go back into the song itself and change a certain track frequency wise or cut out a frequency in the vocals that you don't like. Um, it's possible to do that in the mastering, but mastering should be all about doing just the little last percent to get the song or to, to, to kind of like sprinkle some fairy dust in there and just to enhance it a little bit. But it's not to correct things. And that's why I also, or I just solely do very, very little increments of boosting and cuts and so forth. All right, so this is the compressor, the Koltelnikov. And the next compressor is a multiband compressor. I don't always use a multiband compressor and if you are not quite familiar with multiband compression, it can be quite um, tricky actually, because when you do too much with multiband compression, um, especially on the master bus, you might suck up um, frequency bands um, that you lose energy in your song and you can really mess it up. So what I recommend is doing multiband compression only if you are really familiar with um, or if you have done it and trained it a little bit more. Um, but just some songs don't need it and especially this song didn't actually need much. It just compressed very tiny amounts. It's, it's around 1 dB of compression in this band and also in this just on the midsection. So let's see what it is doing. Maybe you So as you can see, it's barely moving. Not so in the low end, but more to low frequencies. In terms of the bands here, we have here the low end frequency band and the low mid, high mid and the high frequencies. So we have um, four bands in there. And as you can see, I use here around 90, 600, 4,500, and 12,000, so the high end. And this is a very good starting point for multiband compression. And I get sometimes questions what to do with the low end frequency in terms of attack and release and the higher frequencies. And what I recommend to do is, as a starting point is, the lower the frequency, the slower the attack should be. And also, um, the slower the release, because fast releases tend to distort the low end quite a bit. Um, I mean, you have to always listen to it, but this is just some basic, basic um, starting points. Um, here on the low end frequency band, I have an attack of 30 ms and release of 60. Then we got 15 and 40, and as we move up frequency wise, you can see, um, I tend to use faster attacks, 9, 3, and 2, 2 ms just in the high frequency, and also in the release 20, 10, and 10. So the more you move up in the frequency, um, especially in the um, 4, 8, and 60,000 hertz range, you can use um, quite a fast release actually, without distorting or suck out the, um, the life, especially in the low frequencies, um, with a too fast or too slow release. And as you can see, let's, let's solo this band. 
bypass. So just when the drum hits, it compresses a tiny amount. Without it again. Just deepens it out ever so slight to the peaks. And I mean, on this song, it basically you, I, I wouldn't have to do any multiband compression, but um, I just thought it sounded nice here. I could totally go just with the TDR compressor, a little bit more with the TDR compressor, um, but I just wanted to show you here the multiband compression and, and explain my um, philosophy here with the attack and release times um, in terms of the frequency ranges. So I hope I could um, explain it quite a bit to you. Okay, and now um, I would normally use sometimes a tasteful EQ and saturation in there, and I just used saturation here. Sometimes I use a pull textile EQ just to, to boost the high end a little bit more, or the low end, so as I said, with the, the smiley curve EQ. But as the song didn't need this, I just went with a little saturation. And I have to admit, I went here with a preset, and the preset here is the Mastering High Frequency Smoothing Round Bottom. And this is actually not doing much. Again, it's not doing much, but it just adds a tiny amount of saturation. We can add a little bit of saturation in there because the preset actually has none. Um, this is the J37 from Waves. It's a very nice sounding tape machine. Frequency. The chest smoothness to my ear, um, when you listen closely with good headphones or very good monitors, just slightly enhances the, the top end and the bottom end a little bit. Let's add a little bit more saturation. I went without it because I thought it didn't need any. I also have always the, always the noise level down. Because the good thing with plugins is that they don't have any noise in there. This is just a recreation of the old analog machine. And that's actually a good thing about the, um, the plugins digitally that um, in comparison to um, old analog equipment, there is no noise. I mean, you can add it in there for a creativity art, archy thing in, in um, certain instruments, for example, like guitars or in a, in a lo-fi vocal or something like that. But I'm not, not quite a big fan of, of, the, of raising the noise level just because the old analog machine had it. Um, so this is actually the good thing I like about digital. All right, so this is the saturation. And then we come to the last part, the, the limiting. And I use still the good old L2 limiter from Waves. Um, I really know how it sounds. I know what it's doing and it's very easy to use. And I also recommend that to you. I mean, there is the L3 now and there are um, limiters from Isotope, for example, that are really good um, of the Ozone bundle. And, but this is a, a a limiter that I really know. And with the limiter, we have to be careful now. Um, the thing is, when you release your song on certain, um, in, or in, in certain formats actually, um, you have to be careful with peaks, um, especially with a term, it's called true peak. Um, the true peak, you can see here is not your standard peak level that you see on the limiter or on the metering of a standard meter here. The true peak shows you also the so-called intersample peaks. 
um, intersample peaks occur um, when there are peaks and the limiter is not responding to those peaks, but um, in the background, um, because everything is um, calculated mathematically in the digital world, um, there might be intersample peaks when you look at a curve um, where the signal is still peaking even though you don't see it on a normal meter. And that's why you need here the true peak. So let's see what it's, the true peak is doing here. Let's reset it. For example, our meters tell here negative 0.7 because we set the ceiling to that. But the true peak meter is already telling 0 0.6, negative 0 0.6. And when you think of it, when you, when you set your out ceiling, for example, to, let's say, negative 0 0.2, which quite a lot of people do. Let's see what the true peak is doing now. As you can see, negative 0 0.1. We're getting closer to zero, and when we hit zero, we have distortion, clipping. See, in this section, Still negative 0 0.1, and now we had our first clip, even though we couldn't obviously hear it, but we had it. Even though we set it to negative 0 0.2, our logic meter set negative 0 0.2, and we also don't have a peak indicator in this meter here. Also, this meter just tells negative 0 0.2, but the true peak here told us that we already clipped at some point here in the song. So the thing is now, for example, if you would release with a out ceiling of negative 0.2 the song to Apple Masters or to actually any other streaming service, um, they can reject it if they want. I mean, I know that Spotify and all the other streaming services won't um, send it back to you or tell you that, but Apple Digital Masters um, won't accept that, because in the Apple Digital Masters, there are no true peaks allowed that go to zero and above. So there is no clipping allowed. And there is a plugin from Apple that you can use for checking the intersample peaks. It's called the Round Trip AAC. It's free to download. And in the details here, you see the intersample peaks. So let's see again. Let's reset all our meters and let's check again when we hit or when we engage the plugin. Um, this shows us how our song would sound in the AAC format. So let's see. As you can see, we already hit zero. We have a peak here. Again, our logic meter didn't tell us. It tells now negative 0.1, but Apple already told us if we convert the song into AAC, we would have clips in there. If we send that to the Apple, Apple Digital Masters, um, they won't um, take it, actually. So you would have to do it again. And that's why I recommend a go-to out ceiling of good starting point is negative 0.5. As you can see, we have now negative 0.1, even though logic meter tells us again negative 0.5. But we are spot on here at right before zero, and we don't have any clipping problems in there. And also, the um, Apple AC, if we convert it in that, will not have a true peak in there. Um, so don't rely on the standard meterings that come with your DAW. Another thing is the loudness now. And the loudness, you probably have heard or read actually on the internet about the whole loudness war. Um, this is not 
an issue or a, a big issue anymore, but um, in the around late 90s, early 2000s, um, producers and record labels really wanted their masters to be really loud to compete. There was kind of like a, a competition who got the loudest master and the loudest song because our ear perceives loudness with um, a little bit, or actually our ear tells us if we hear a louder sound, it will sound better, especially when it goes to songs. So a louder song might um, sound better, but it isn't actually because when you bring it down, um, you can see that there are no dynamics left if you really compress it when you push the threshold all the way down. Um, and when you bring up the level of a dynamic master um, to the same level, um, so the RMS level of a compressed, a really heavily compressed master just to make it louder, um, you will immediately hear that the more dynamic master will sound not quieter, it will sound probably even louder, but you have all the dynamics in there. Um, so always keep in mind, don't um, over compress your masters and especially also not your mixes. Um, and with this song, when we look here, it, maybe I just took off some peaks. So for example, when you pull the threshold back, let's turn it up. I mean, when you make it quite loud and we compress it even further, negative 4 dB, 5 dB of compression. Again, we would have a problem with the true peak, so we would have to turn down the arm out ceiling again. But to my ear, this wouldn't suit the song very good, actually. Um, I like the dynamics. I like that it starts, for example, here in this quiet part, where just a, um, a guitar, piano, and vocal, just some tasty drums. And then it goes into the build up here. Where it gets a little bit louder. And let's push it back. Where do we go from here? So in, in terms of loudness, now when we focus on the long term, the um, LUFS, um, a good point that I would consider is negative 14 LUFS. Um, this is basically a, a good reference where when you upload your song to um, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube and so forth, um, won't get turned up or turned down too much. Um, some of the streaming services have built-in limiters um, because they want that the songs have a coherent level. When you have, for example, a playlist in Spotify, they want that the songs sound pretty much the same. I don't know exactly um, which streaming service has now what um, in terms of limiting and so forth, um, but they do have something going on. Um, but negative 14 is a, a very good starting point that your song might be unchanged in terms of loudness after you upload it to um, the various um, streaming um, and download services. So in the short term here, in the louder parts, we have a little bit more LUFS. But you always have to keep in mind over the whole program. So also in the quieter parts, let's reset it again. So you would have normally played the whole song through and then um, see what the oh, LUFS, the long term, is telling you. Core, and I think that you, you're telling lies. You wouldn't know the truth. Let's go to this section. Meaning, but 
So as you can see, here's, you also see the range in terms of the quieter and the louder parts. We have six um, loudness units, um, which is quite good um, because it tells you that your song has still quite a lot of dynamics. Let's go here. Alright, so negative 13 here, so we would have probably turned down the threshold a little bit. Um, so we hit 14 at the end of the program, but this is just the starting point. So negative 14 LUFS is a good starting point. To sum up what I recommend when you do your own master is, first of all, um, don't do too much. If you have to do um, more EQ cuts or boosts, um, it's always to go better into the mixing stage and do it on the various tracks or in the mix itself, rather than in the master. Mastering is just for um, slight enhancements in terms of EQ. I mean, you can take out um, some frequencies, um, but I recommend really doing it always in the mastering stage. Um, in terms of compression, don't use too much compression. Leave dynamics in there. And um, if you have to do a little bit more compression to control peaks in some certain areas, um, do it with um, a linear um, multiband EQ like this one from Waves, um, where you can target certain frequency bands because the peaks are sometimes just in certain um, frequencies that you want to control. Um, and then when it comes to kind of like sprinkle fairy dust on it and enhance it a little more, um, use a little bit saturation, for example, like a tape machine. There are many different other options that you can use. Um, or also just use a, a pull textile EQ that adds a little bit of saturation in there, even if you don't boost anything. You, you just um, um, kind of like get it in the chain and it's doing actually nothing rather than just sitting there um, engaged. And last but not least, in terms of limiting loudness, um, get a meter like the um, WLM Plus, which shows you the long-term LUFS and also the true peak. Um, as I said, very important true peak, um, true peak, especially when you want to reuse it for a Apple mast because um, of the um, true peak that you here, see here in the intersample, which tells you the same here in the true peak. Um, always check that also with the round trip AAC plugin. And um, loudness, as I said, negative 14 LUFS. All right, so those are the basic um, things that I am mostly due to mastering. Of course, every song is different. You can't really copy those settings I used here um, to your songs because obviously you would have to have the very same song um, that I have um, for genres. The chain might be completely different, um, but this is my go-to change that I always start with. Um, I change certain plugins, of course, um, depending on the song. For example, for a more um, kind of like um, acoustic-driven song, maybe just a acoustic guitar and a vocal, I would maybe not use um, um, a multiband compressor, so just a, a EQ compressor and a um, limiter, for example, so I wouldn't really do anything to that. And for a more dense song like a EDM track or or a rock song or something like that, um, that can take a little bit more compression because it sounds a little bit more or has more impact, perceived impact. Um, you can do a little bit more multiband compression and also saturation, so play with that. Um, but always don't make it too loud negative 14 LUFS is a good reference point. Um, let's check now for the last step. Um, when you export your song, which I do basically just um, on the master output here, um, probably I have output 27 to 28. You just have um, output one and two, but this is just in my setup here because I have quite a large um, audio interface. I just use the bounce option here in the track. And um, 
I use here the PCM 24-bit, um, um, and this depends in which um, sample rate the song is recorded and mixed. Um, I wouldn't upsample it um, and also not downsample it because the streaming services um, will, most of them will accept 44 or 48 um, kilohertz of sample rate, 24-bit um, resolution. Um, as far as detering goes, I recommend the um, detering here in Logic. Um, the first one is quite good, um, but there is also detering here in the L2. Um, T to type 1, I just leave it at that with the normal shaping, it's um, good enough. And so then basically you can use the real-time bounce, so the whole song gets um, bounced in real-time or offline. Um, I recommend real-time. I think it, it might be a little bit closer to what I hear in the, in the live mastering session here, um, but it's also totally fine just to do it offline. Um, you can also use, um, or you can export it at the same time in MP3 and M4A AAC, but basically when you upload it um, to a streaming service, um, always use the, the PCM so you get a standard WAV file and the um, distributor will um, 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 change for MP3 and so forth in their own system. All right, and yeah, that's basically it. I just hit OK and the whole thing gets bounced out. So what I recommend um, as distribution, once you master your track, um, I always recommend Bandcamp because with Bandcamp it's a independent, so you don't need um, a label for that, um, which or, or where you can just create an account like I did here. And once you created your account, you click here and plus add. You can decide if you want to upload a track or a full album or even merchandise. And then you get this form here where you just add your track name. You can set here the track pricing, so how much you want to charge for your song. You can also, for example, write in the lyrics and some facts about this track and so forth. Um, Bandcamp Pro lets you also add videos upload your track art and tags and so forth and genre. You can also, if you have it, an ISRC code and the release date. And once you uploaded your audio, um, Bandcamp will um, change it automatically, um, so convert it into um, the different formats like FLAC. Um, if you upload it in WAV, it will still be in WAV. And um, then you're actually good to go, so you save it and you can share your um, song or your album or EP with your fans and um, the people that would like to hear your music. Um, another option um, that I recommend, and I don't get paid for that, is TuneCore, because I already released some songs um, with TuneCore, and this is basically a label um, that takes care of all the different distributions um, um, like streaming services, iTunes, Amazon Play, Google Play, and so forth. So all the online streaming and download services. And as you can see, an album costs for the first year 29.99 euros, um, and then it costs 49 per year. Single is just 99, and um, well, it's just a phone. Um, jingle, um, but here the single is just 9.99 and they don't charge you or take away anything from your sales. So this is just the, um, the amount that they would charge you and nothing more. Um, and that's why I always recommend that. And once you upload or click on the create single or album, you have this form here um, with the song title again, artists, genres and so forth and um, also the um, different codes if you have one. And so you just fill out this form and upload your song and they will take care of everything. It just takes basically two to three days sometimes um, that your song will appear on iTunes, Spotify and Google Play and so forth. And then you can share it again, but in this case you can't decide um, how much you will charge for the song. Um, it's always, I think, in Apple, it's a 
um, fixed rate it's 99 um, euros or dollars or 129 so this is a fixed rate um, in Bandcamp for example you can decide your own pricing of the track or of the album um, but of course um, Bandcamp is kind of like so the indie platform and with TuneCore you get distributed to all the online stores so you can decide yourself um, what you want to choose and but you can also of course use it in um, both distribution forms. That's basically it once again. I hope I could give you a good overview about the mastering process and how to get your song out there. Um, of course, as I said, every good mastering starts with a good mix. So if you have to do any changes or any CV changes in mastering, it's always better to go back into the mixing stage, change the little things in there and go back to mastering. Uh, mastering is all about enhancing a song, but not to correct big things like um, really great changes in frequencies or something like that. Or if there is distortion in the mix, there will be distortion in the master. So mastering is all about the little things and about um, critical listening. So keep that always in mind. All right, so thanks for watching and have a nice day.